I'm Rachel Cunliffe. On today's episode of the New Statesman podcast, we're taking a break from news of the Queen's funeral and instead talking about housing. I'll be speaking to Hashi Mohammed, the barrister and author of the new book, A Home of One's Own, Why the Housing Crisis Matters. Well, Hashi, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Your book is a very powerful, rousing sort of manifesto about the urgent need to solve the the housing crisis, which is something that we've talked a lot about on the NS podcast before. We've written a lot about it's an issue that I think people are very well aware is a crisis that needs to be tackled in some way. But you've kind of gone further than that in, in your work and sort of said that this isn't just a crisis of housing and accommodation, it's something much deeper in terms of sort of structural issues with our society. And and I wondered if you could sort of start by explaining what you mean by that and why you think this is a a societal and almost a moral crisis, not just a housing one. Yeah, I agree that the problem we are faced with today for me is really encapsulated by the way we used to do things and the way we currently do things. And to give you an example of that, Rachel, in 1950 to around 1960, for example, housing was actually in the public health department of government. So housing wasn't necessarily treated as a, currently it's treated a local government issue for local plans to try and make up for the housing for our populations, but rather something that was a public health matter that meant that to deal with the housing crisis issue was to deal with the health and well-being of individuals, the health and well-being of families, children, the health and well-being of society and aspirations and opportunities and the future. And that, for me, speaks to how this issue was seen before and how we currently see it. And perhaps also, crucially, it speaks to the lack of urgency. And so what I try and talk about and what I try and argue for in the book is fundamentally, at the moment, housing is a human issue. Behind all the statistics, behind the house prices, behind the data of mortgages, behind interest rates, behind all of these facts and figures, lies a fundamentally tragic human problem. And what I try to do in the, with this issue is I try and humanize it through my own professional and personal experiences. But I try and humanize it because I'm hoping that this approach will give it a sense of urgency that it used to have and that it doesn't currently have at the moment. Yeah, I think that that human angle is really important because there are, I mean, there were all kinds of of stats about this that we can talk about a bit later, some, some really quite astonishing ones. But what it comes down to is children, families, people growing up living in a state which doesn't feel secure and not being able to engage fully with society or education or their jobs because there is this underlying instability. You you start very movingly with your own experience of sort of being insecurely housed. What what do you think that the impact is of that, that people who have always had a roof over their head and always known where they live, whether they own or rent, and who have never faced that particular form of instability what don't they understand about what it does to, say, a child or a young person growing up in that kind of environment? Yes. So I talk about growing up in Northwest London in the sort of mid to late 90s, where we were living in one squalor council accommodation to the next, where we did not have much stability, let alone a roof over our heads for longer than six to nine months at a time. And for me, one of the things that really made me understand that and what was happening to us was when I became a homeowner myself about seven years ago, because 
a huge mind shift took place in the sense that this was the first time where I was living in a property that was my own, where the landlord wasn't going to kick me out or the council wasn't going to tell us that there is a court order evicting us. And what I learned from that experience was just to look back at what was happening to me and realize that the level of precariousness that we were experiencing, the lack of stability that was rife and continues to be rife for so many people, the lack of any idea of understanding that having your own room and having posters of your favorite footballer or a pop star on your walls, having your own bed to come back to, to sulk in, to cry, to laugh, to play games in, being able to walk out of that front door and know that behind you is a roof that you will come back to that evening, for me, fundamentally rewires the brains of human beings in a way that some people will struggle to succeed and others will struggle to find their place in society. And that's what I'm talking about. It's the health and well-being. It's the mental and physical health. It is about a whole host of things that is really at the center of whether or not people will succeed or whether they will fail, whether they will go far, whether they won't go far, or whether they will ha really build roots in that community, or whether they will always feel transient and never quite settled. There's real value in that, that sense of stability, particularly sort of in juxtaposition to the way in politics or in the media, we often talk about council housing and, and social housing. You've got a quote towards the end of the book from Morrissey saying, I came from nothing, I came from a council house. Basically, the idea being that a council house or a council flat is nothing, is not something to be valued. Whereas one of the points that I think comes across and that we don't often think about is that actually having a secure accommodation, even if it is owned and rented to you by the state or the council or a housing association, can provide that sense of stability, that sense of continuity, even if you're not owning it or, or renting it in, in the private sector. And I sort of wonder to what extent do you think part of the reason successive governments haven't been able, despite saying that they will, haven't been able to make progress on this issue, is that we don't value that and the fundamentals enough and we only look instead to the market and, and an ownership model. Yeah, no, I think the Morrissey quote that you're referring to there, it really, really infuriates me because he's like, oh, I came from nothing. I came from a council property. And you're like, well, hang on. I'm sorry, but there's nothing shameful about coming from a council house. Actually, coming from a council house has afforded you a level of stability that has potentially nurtured and really propelled this great career that you've had that you're now here reflecting on Desert Island Discs, which is where that comment was, was made. And I feel like, like, looking back, he doesn't even have the self-awareness and the presence of mind to appreciate that what he had then was an enormous amount of privilege, a huge amount of privilege that is not afforded to people today. And to go to the second point there about where we are now and the mess that we're in. Well, for that, we've got to thank politics because what people often don't understand, and I'm a planning lawyer, is that planning is politics and politics is planning. And what has happened over the last 30, 35 years is we've seen the successive governments starting with the liberalization of the markets, the selling off of council house through right to buy with Margaret Thatcher, the fact that the Labour, the first Labour government in a, a long time concentrating on hospitals and schools and not realizing that a pu big part of public health and the public realm is also about ensuring that people have enough housing to live on, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that then that kind of neglect gets seeped into the system that then just gets passed down. And that's why we've got to this point. And I'm afraid the market has failed. The market cannot provide for what we need. The market is unable to provide for what we need. And the market, frankly, isn't equipped to provide for what we need. 
The reality is that the market wishes to make a profit. But on housing matters, I'm afraid we have to accept that it's a public good for the public health and that you're not going to make a profit. And the only way people are going to understand that is through making sure that we go back to the days when it, it was left to local authorities supported by central government funding to build our social housing. Everyone knows that this is a, this is a challenge. Uh, all part- political parties pay lip service to it. But the thing they, they always come back to is the, the problem at the heart of it is, is the planning system. If we could just improve our planning system, we would kind of solve this this crisis. And I'm interested in the idea that actually both the market and the planning system are kind of trying to do too many things because house builders are trying to make a profit. And with planning, we are trying to protect our environment and make sure that we have the right level of public services for the amount of accommodation we have in places and balance the rights of existing residents and future residents, and also make sure that it makes sense from a financial stability yeah. perspective, especially in the light of the 2008 financial crisis. Um, that's too many competing priorities. Way too many. Yeah. I completely agree. It's way too many. And as you will know, I reflect on some of that in the book. But the simple conclusion of pointing to the planning system as the source and the center of all of our ills is completely mistaken. Because the reality is that the the planning system is a reflection of what politicians think we need as a society. Our planning system reflects political priorities. And as long as the political priorities are only giving lip service to this issue, we won't get anywhere. We won't make any progress so long as somebody like Liz Truss can stand on a platform where she says 300,000 houses a year is a Stalinist figure that I'm going to get rid of. Or when Rishi Sunak is asked about building in the green belt, he goes on to say, well, no, we're never going to you know, build on the green belt. We don't want to kind of ruin our, our, our green and pleasant land and so on and so forth. And for me, when you hear those kind of rhetoric, when you hear those kind of speeches, that then goes down to seep into the system. And that includes the planning system as we know it. And let me give you this example of how that works differently, Rachel. I don't suppose Liz Truss will know this, but in September 1950, Winston Churchill, addressing his party conference, says, and I quote, You have put to me that we must have a target of 300,000 homes a year. I accept it, and that will be our priority. Winston Churchill is saying the 300,000 houses a year. And then what does he do? He gives to Harold Macmillan. He makes Harold Macmillan his housing minister. Harold Macmillan, at the beginning, was a bit reticent, and he says, I'm afraid, and I quote, housing is not really my cup of tea. Winston Churchill then convinces him to do it. And he says to him, it is a gamble. It will make or mar your political career, but every humble home will bless you and bless your name if you succeed. And this is the best bit. Then there's this amazing clip that I recently discovered in some of the documentaries about the passing of the Queen, where you have Harold Macmillan wearing a double-breasted three-piece suit in the middle of a massive housing project with people shoveling sand and soil behind him. And he says, looking at the camera dramatically, he says, this here is our housing message. The quicker you build, you will be able to build, or you will be asked to build. That was the last time we ever met the housing targets for what we need in society. So to go back straight to the beginning of your, of your question, it's easy to point to the planning system and say, that's the problem. For me, planning is politics. And if the political priority puts this center stage and is well, it really willing to move quickly, things can happen. And it's happened before. <laughs> that's so so fascinating and it's so different from the attitude of politicians now 
So where where I grew up in Barnet in North London, the MP uh, recently there was a photo of of her with some residents holding signs, and they were celebrating that they had rejected planning to build to convert uh, an old gasometer into I think three hundred homes. Um, everyone in the photo w- was in there. I would say o- over fifty, most of them over over sixty, and they were celebrating. And I think. Um, one of the things, I mean, that you could go through the, the the Twitter feed of any number of, of MPs and see them say, on the one hand, we need more housing. And then on the other hand, uh, taking pride in the fact that they've managed to block a development in, in their local constituency. They're just not <laughs> serious. It infuriates me. It absolutely infuriates me. They are not serious. And part of the problem is also when I turn up at a public inquiry, I'm going to start a public inquiry in Surrey, near Gillingham, Guildford, sorry, on Tuesday. And I promise you in the crowd will be a bunch of silver haired people who bought their houses for 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 pounds about 40 years ago. And they will be standing there saying, oh, we don't want this housing. We don't want this housing. We're concerned about traffic. We're concerned about the, the flooding. We're concerned about all sorts of issues that, that the testing has shown they don't need to be concerned about but they will stand there. And the elephant in the room is they're, con- they're really fundamentally concerned about their property prices. And they're the only ones who go and vote. Local councillor will turn up. And who's he going to listen to? Some spotty 18-year-old who's busy trying to get drunk or whatever and doesn't know what a public inquiry looks like. Or a, a 50, 60-year-old who is th- looking at this councillor and saying, if you don't help us reject this, you're not going to get our votes. Who's that councillor going to respond to? It's, it's fundamentally unserious and unfair. And, and one of the things that you sort of point to in the book is who gets represented at hearings that are intended to sort of balance different interests. The people who are already living there by virtue of the fact that they are already living there and also that they have the time to turn up are a much more close, exactly. solid, visual uh, exactly. representation of what might be lost and all the potential people who might be able to to buy a home if and afford a home if it were built, but they don't exactly. have the, the time or the resources to turn up. Hi, it's Anoush here. This is just a reminder that as a podcast listener, you have the option of subscribing to the New Statesman with a very special offer. You can subscribe for just a pound a week. That's 12 weeks for £12. If you go to newstatesman.com forward slash podcast offer. We'll be right back. From the New Statesman comes a new podcast, Audio Long Reads, the best of our reported features and essays, read aloud. Featuring writing from our authors, including Ian McEwan on wrestling with Orwell's Inside the Whale. Might we reasonably assume that there is no longer an inside to the whale? That the creature lies stranded on the beach, as whales sometimes are? That the guts and blubber and ribcage are on display? A year inside GB News with Stuart McGurk. At first, the problems weren't ideological, but practical, technical, and quite, well, obvious. And Maria Wilczek on Belarusian football fans who took on Alexander Lukashenko. After the August 2020 protests, hundreds of ultras were roughed up and held in custody. One was later found dead in suspicious circumstances. Ease into the weekend with our audio long reads, published every Saturday morning. Just search... Audio long reads from the New Statesman, wherever you get your podcasts. Let me ask you this. When you look at those people in Barnet, them standing there grinning and happy about the fact that they stopped housing that people need, how does it make you feel as somebody who, I don't know what your financial circumstances are, but you, how do you feel about somebody who might not be able to afford to live where you grew up and where you, ha- you are part of the community? How does that make you feel? What I want to ask them is exactly that. What I want to say is, you probably have children or, or grandchildren and obviously you care about them. 
So where do you think they are going to be able to live? How do you think that this problem is going to be solved in the future to try and sort of get that sense of intergenerational solidarity? Because I do think that people are able to care about sort of what happens to their immediate family. It's the abstract of other people that it's quite difficult to necessarily balance if you are concerned about value in your own home going up or down or spoiling of you or anything else. But I, I guess what, I want, what I'm interested in is if you have this political gridlock because councillors and local MPs are by definition going to pay attention to the people who make noise and, and who threaten to not vote for them uh, and they are going to try and protect their own interests, how do you change it? How do you get a system that actually does balance the rights of existing residents who may have very valid concerns, but also the, the rights of people who would be residents if only the housing were available and, and, and made affordable? It's a good question. And for me, we can do it in, 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 in three ways. One is that people are going to, I don't know if you know, but once we had a really acute housing crisis in the 70s, it led to a massive movement of squatting. There was this huge movement of people just squatting in empty properties and asking the police and the council to remove them if they did. And I really do think we're getting to the point where drastic, potentially illegal activities. Mass civil disobedience. Mass civil disobedience. I really do think, and I'm not being hyperbolic about this, I'm not the sort of person who would advocate for such a thing, but I genuinely believe that the current status quo, if this continues, we are headed for that sort of thing. So that's the first thing to just point out. Secondly, I think we have to find a way of taking the politics out of planning. Now, it cannot necessarily mean, and that doesn't necessarily follow, that everything has to be some sort of technocratic stats and data-based analysis about housing and where it's needed and how it needs to come together. I'm not suggesting that that is the fundamental answer. And the reason for that is because there has to be some sort of accountability. And the only way we can get that accountability is through the democratic system. But what I'm understanding now and what I'm talking about in the book is that that democratic accountability in the system is fundamentally broken now because it's been hijacked by a minority who are essentially the puppet masters and the puppets are shallow politicians who do not understand the strategic bigger picture. And they understand that getting into politics is simply all about pleasing those who put you there rather than showing leadership and saying, I hear what you say. I want to balance these things, but just because you voted for me doesn't mean I only work for you. I must also work for those people who did not vote for me and for whose interests it is to do this differently. Now, I don't want to hold my breath, but that's not going to happen anytime soon either. The third aspect of it is for someone or some party or some organization radically goes in and puts in a program that says, this is what we want to do. And it honestly isn't that difficult. If you think about the Greenbelt, for example, which is this crazy policy that came in 1947 to stop urban sprawl, the Greenbelt is treated as some sort of a kind of holy grail that can't be touched. And it's associated with that brilliant sort of Tolkien and and, and ideas about the green and pleasant land and, and, and people have those connotations. I'm sorry, go around and see the green belt that surrounds London. Most of it is derelict. Most of it is dumping grounds. Most of it is contaminated land. It needs regeneration. And a lot of people would happily move there. So that gives you an example of what's possible right now. If we just literally built on about, you know, since 2006, We've built on less than 1% of the green belt, less than 1%. And people act like the green belt is being concreted over. It's mad. And the way I describe it in the book is that the housing market, frankly, you can call it a housing market, but it's a Ponzi scheme. It's a Ponzi scheme where the people who are already on the property ladder 
are happy to be there, but they don't want anyone else to join. And the banks are underpinning that Ponzi scheme by never putting up the interest rates. Because back in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, early 90s, when the interest rates were always going up and down, it really did mean that you, if you survived, it meant that you could afford to survive. But today, everyone is holding by up on the, on the housing ladder, on the skin of their teeth. And if the Bank of England increases interest rate by a few percentage points upwards, there'll be a lot of people falling off, which is probably needed because that sort of correction is what we need right now. So again, like there are plenty of ideas. They're just not politically palatable. And that's the bit I don't know how to get over. And I don't want you to ask me whether I should go into politics. Okay, Rachel? <laughs> I, I was actually going to ask that because he makes oh. a very interesting case. <laughs> but I won't. What I will ask you, because this is a, a sort of politics podcast, is we've got a new prime minister. Uh, I think we've got a new housing minister or secretary of state for loving up and housing. I think we've had more than 20 since 1997. Are we on the 23rd now? It's very difficult to keep up. We've had 14 housing ministers in 12 years. Wow. Like, I mean, like, just think about it. What other government department would tolerate that kind of nonsense? It's kind of often treated as sort of a stepping stone, previous, do an okay job here and you'll get moved on to a better job. Exactly. Place, um, which is probably not the way to deal with the issue that is probably one of the top issues in, in most people's lives. Let's say you got, I don't know, you're stuck in a broken lift with Liz Truss and whoever the, the new housing minister is, and you have the opportunity to kind of make one point to them about why this is not just a priority, this is fundamental to British society and British, the British economy and British democracy working sort of properly. How do you explain it? How do you explain that to them that they should put aside the, the vested interests and the the incentive they have to focus on immediately what is going to make them popular with their with their core base? What, How do you make that it, case for the Conservatives? It's actually a very easy case to make, right? Because all you need to say to them is, "Listen, when Margaret Thatcher decided to introduce right to buy." the policy that allowed a lot of people who were living in council properties to buy their own homes. What she did was overnight, she created a massive addition to our democracy with a bunch of people who were property owning people. And that is fundamentally conservative because if you are already on the property ladder, paying a mortgage, and you are enjoying your property and your building going up in value, you have a vested interest to conserve the status quo. Hence, the moment you become a homeowner or a parent, you naturally become more conservative. So you as a conservative minister or you as a conservative prime minister should face this thing head on in the short term turning against your own conservative base, who frankly aren't going to last that long in life. They don't have much time to go. And turn to the next generation. These people who are now 18, 19, and 20, maybe socialists or a bit leftists now, if you can help them get on the property ladder by the time they get to 25 or 30, I promise you they will not be voting anything other than conservative thereon. So it's in your vested interest now to take some bold steps and it may cause you some short-term pain with these older folks, but the long-term gains are going to be for you and your party for the foreseeable future. But then that will be quickly dismissed by somebody like Ms. Trust because she's probably going to get decapitated in two years. Well, I was, I was going to say, we don't know how many conservative ministers we have listening, uh, but for any who are, there you have it. Um, there's the case. The um, the book is called A Home of One's Own, Why the Housing Crisis Matters. It's full of, of ideas, but also just reframing of how we should think about um, this, this crisis and, and, and what it means. Um, and Hashi, thank you so much for coming on the podcast to talk to us about it. Not at all. Thank you so much. It's lovely to... Um be here and thank you for having me Rachel and, and New Statesman as well You've been listening to the New Statesman podcast with me Rachel Cunliffe and my guest 
barrister and author Hashi Muhammad. We're produced by Mae Robson and our music is Devil with the Devil, licensed under Creative Commons. If you enjoyed this podcast, don't forget to subscribe and leave us a nice review.